Welcome to the 30th anniversary of Real Affirmations LGBTQ Plus International Film Festival, held October 20th through 22nd, 2023, in our nation's capital. This year's historical film festival presents 58 new, retro, and compelling international documentary, short, and feature films from 23 countries. 32 films will screen live at the State of the Art Movie Theater inside the Eaton Hotel, 1201 K Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., and 43 films can be uh, screened virtually from the comfort of your home or on that long commute. Joining me today is one of the filmmakers to give us a behind the scenes peek at their inspiration process and anecdotal experience in making love, one of our feature films. Welcome, Sufat, with me this morning and tell me where are you joining us from and welcome. Thank you so much, Redora, for having me. I'm joining you from Mumbai, where it is uh, 9.30 at night. And it's so exciting that uh, Real Affirmations is having its 30th year. And they've uh, dug into their archives and invited us to screen at this uh, edition of the festival. It will bring new audiences to the film. I'm always happy to support that. And I'm here to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much. So. As a retro film uh, made in 2015, I am thinking about <clears throat> the political climate around LGBTQ plus issues. Has there been any significant shifts, even though uh, one of the points in your press kit is that um, this is not political? But you know our lives have become political. So what's the what's the trajectory since 2015? Oh my God, it's like in a way the world has completely changed, and in a way nothing has. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll go back to that statement first. I think everything is political. Being apolitical is the most political thing that is. So I always tell people the most political thing about the film is that it's not political at all. It doesn't go down any of, um, and I'll say this without demeaning fellow filmmakers who've made very political films, um, each to each their own, I feel. Each strategy has its own advantages. But um, this particular film, by staying away from the traditional activist routes that queer films are usually pushed down, I, in fact, felt it would be really fun and confrontational to make a film that pretends as if there is no problem. In 2015, when we were making it, and in a way in 2023, when people watch it, the threat on queer lives and expressions of queer love is so omnipresent and so permeating that when, it, when you see two people freely expressing their love for each other, there's something unnerving about it it's almost like you're waiting for disaster to strike, right? You're waiting for that love to be attacked. Mm -hmm. Because also partly because so much of our films play on that. That is the point of conflict. And so when the conflict in this particular film becomes internal and it becomes about relationships, something about that is so deeply unsettling. And what greater way for me to shine a mirror and remind people of how much of our lives is under threat than to point their attention to this uneasiness they constantly feel. Do you know, um, speaking to how the political climate has changed in India, um, well, sodomy was uh, punishable by life imprisonment and criminalized when I was writing the film, casting the film and shooting the film. Um, we couldn't tell places where we were going and shooting the film even what the film was about. I'd always tell people it's a film about friendship, you know, three friends on a road trip, like la 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 la. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I couldn't even tell most of the crew. It was very much on a need to know basis. And then as and when we gained their trust, they'd find out about it. I'd always be worried that, you know, there might be some protest or they might shut us down or not give us a location. So why bother? Um, so, I, I mean, I, I'd love to say we've been part of that change, but, you know, there are struggles so much bigger than ours yeah. lives and people so much bigger than ours who've 
gone at it directly and put their blood, sweat and tears. If, uh, if the film helped that along, great. Um, but I'm so happy that I remember the day our Supreme Court reversed that very archaic British law which criminalized sodomy. My phone couldn't stop ringing. I got messages from strangers from all over the world. And it really made me feel like we were part of that. And so I definitely enjoyed it. Um, in some ways, nothing has changed because I always used to, you know, when, when it used to come up in Q&As, when we were touring with the film, people would say, you know, do you want gay marriage to be legal? Do you want like, I'm like, I think legal status helps because it takes away at least the bigots and bullies cannot point to the law of the land to justify their hatred. Mm -hmm. But social attitudes, that's where the real change happens. Can I, can I walk down the street without worrying? Can I not have that second thought before I declare my orientation? Those are the things that really tell me, has there been enough change? And yes, things are trending towards the better. But I think like these recent times we live in are teaching us, all change is reversible. Yeah. All progress, if not held on to and justified and earned and fought for on a daily basis, is reversible. Yes. So it also reminds you that, you know, these hard fought battles and victories can all disappear. So one isn't, you know, not to be taken for granted. That covers um, a series of other questions I was going to ask was, how did you navigate the risks of an inquiring public uh, about what you were shooting and, you know, who was on set and the, um, the, the, the wonder, the probing eyes wanted to know what was happening. So thanks for covering that for me. <laughs> now, no I have to say, this is one of the sweetest romance to romance movies out there. <laughs> yes, yes. And we feel the the love and it could have gone either way. I think this could have been cast in any culture. It could have been cast by any race. It could have been cast by any class system. Um, because the the uh, fear of intimacy, I think that plagues men, um, and they're wondering, does it go into romance when in fact it may not? But oh, how beautiful it is! Should it? Uh, and both are, you know, are consenting. So say more about how slowly you reveal to us that the romance was really. Uh, an emerging romance. I love that. I love that. It's such a it's such a great question. Um, I thought it was. I thought I thought it was delicious. Um, having that fun with the audience. I love toying with them. I loved uh, unpeeling that onion, teaching like giving them one information and contradicting it, and then contradicting it again and contradicting it again, and. Uh, because, you know, I was also thinking about my conservative aunt and uncle, the, you know, the, the, the stranger down the street who isn't really coming in going, oh, my God, I want to see my queer life represented on screen. Why don't I see this movie? I knew I would have to get them comfortable. So I chose to make a film for someone who isn't homophobic, but isn't comfortable and might not know how to handle the subject matter. So I took my time and made sure they fell in love with the problem before, you know, because a lot of people I think are comfortable with the idea of gay people. And then they're confronted with the physical um, expression of that love. Mm -hmm. And that suddenly throws everything. And you know, the fact that we took our time to reveal what was happening here, got them so invested that at some point when the two of them weren't going for it, I wanted the audience to go, come on already, just say something. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to them going, oh, oh, yeah. not my kind of film, right? So it was a very specific kind of game I was playing with a very specific kind of audience. And uh, also, I think, having been in that position, 
both with women and men. It's horrible having a crush. It's horrible being in love and not being able to express it. It's horrible not knowing how the other person feels. And I wanted to just play with that, like, that tantalizing trauma of it. You know, you just want to convince yourself it's not real and I can do away with it. And it sucks giving up that power and telling someone you like them. Mm -hmm. Like It really is agony. And I think part of what I loved hearing from audiences is straight or bi or queer or whatever, you know, that agony is the same. It just cuts yeah. across all the patients. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of I, I don't know if I answered the question. Oh, you I did. did my, you did. Okay, it was just one of those points that I was like, what a tease. But let me tell you what gave it away for me um, when they were uh, getting dressed the first day and they were they were bickering over the shower time. I was just like, oh, this is an old love story right here. <laughs> just waiting to happen. And yep. one guy's clueless, maybe or maybe not. <laughs> that was. No, I, um, I think I don't know if anyone ever is. I feel like sometimes we pretend to be. Because, yeah. you know, that's got its own power dynamic. And, mm -hmm. you know, we talked it over the person. But I don't know. I mean, maybe once or half a time in my life, I've been truly caught blindsided by someone who had a crush. But most of the time, you know, they're so nice to you. They do some things yeah. for you. Kind of know. Kind of know. Yeah. And then you're like, especially when you don't like them back. Like for me, that's also, you know, a big part of where the film came from. When I found myself on the shorter end of that stick, it's almost like I wanted to make a manual for, you know, how you treat that other person. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, because yeah. it can be fun to, you know, oh, really? Mm -hmm. You like me? Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I'm like, oh, really? So you were just enjoying the benefits of all these favors and all the like pushing it. You know, you know. Yeah. And yeah. it's as important to be super responsible with how you handle that. Because when that person has a crush on you, you have that power over them and then what you do with that power, it's very like, you know, you have to be responsible. That's right. It it uh can give life or it could definitely crush a sweet soul. What other film um makers inspired you particularly? I'm thinking in the as far as the cinematography goes, because we go from the very uh, somber, dark space, then we have a bright space, then we have a closed space, and then we have the mountain space. So uh, did you find that inspiration from somewhere else, or did it just organically flow from writing the story of where you wanted the characters to go? Um, I feel I'm definitely a very visual writer. I always think about transcribing the film I'm seeing in my head. And so much of the film was about going on the road trip with them, mm -hmm. being in the moment. So I knew I definitely wanted to have these long flowing shots. I also loved the idea of imperfection. Like I loved the idea of, I felt like the more mistakes there were in the cinematography, focus, exposure, mm -hmm. the breathing, the roughness, the more you would stop wondering if it's real. Yeah, yeah. The more you would stop, because <laughs> I think all of us are so bludgeoned, even back in 2015, we're bludgeoned by the perfection of advertising. And so much filmmaking automatically subscribes to that. Without even thinking about it, all of us are trying to make perfect images. Almost as though it's a contract we signed with the audience. No such contract exists. The audience is up for whatever you give them as long as they see intention and purpose. Mm -hmm. I loved, I mean, I mean, I think there were days my cinematographer wanted to kill me. But I loved burdening her with the labor of shooting a 16-minute long take. Going from inside to outside, back inside where the exposures changed five stops, mm -hmm. where she's having to pull focus on the camera. Her AC doesn't have the benefit of a monitor. We're getting so much of it wrong. But I could see where she was unwavering is she never left the characters. And when I would look at these images, what I would feel as if I'm in the room with them. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciated the hell out of the freedom I enjoyed from my partnering producers, 
from my financiers, from everyone around me that they let me do that. I've gone on to make bigger, better, bigger, bigger, more well-financed things. And everyone would have a heart attack. Which is a crime. It's a pity. Because I also feel like I'm trying to lower the audience's guard. I'm letting them believe that they are watching such an amateurish work, such amateurish work that I couldn't possibly manipulate or lie to them. I don't even have the ability to really move the camera the way I want. And they lower their guard and lower their guard and lower their guard and lull them into a position of trust where when that all-important scene happens, where I truly can never paint a real enough picture, they don't question it because mm -hmm. by then they've believed me. Yes, right. That's right. So it was a very precise strategy of getting them to trust me, of making them feel they are beyond the artifice of cinematography and perfection and lighting. And it's really almost a documentary film. The two so, places where mm -hmm. I am glad to hear that I was wondering, <clears throat> I needed the, I needed to be in the backseat of the car. So I did not want that to be a green screen, uh, the street scene. And on the mountain, I was, I sure hope this isn't, a, a green screen because uh, for hikers or anybody who's been, you know, uh, uh, in touch with nature, that is such a sacred pinnacle of, uh, and a place to be. So I'm glad to hear that there wasn't the green screen perfection that can happen there. And I don't, I think that's going to come across. Um, you're taking us to those places will have, is definitely translated and I think it's going to make an impression on our on our um, on our guest without Thank giving you. away any spoilers are there any is there a theme that resonates now I talk I call it the bromance to the romance the tension of uh, having the crush and not crush and the politics of just existing. Are there any other meta themes that you'd like for us to attune our ear to? I think we talked a little bit about how to deal with a person when there is a power imbalance in a relationship. Yeah. That I think is very important. The concept of empathy and kindness there. Um, without giving away spoilers, I think it's very important to take care of yourself. I think all the research I did pointed out to we're so busy avoiding the idea of victimhood that we immediately imagine it never happened. Yeah. We start comforting the other person. And sometimes it takes you six months, one year, two years, five years to realize, you know, what happened wasn't okay. Um, I feel, I just, like, I, I don't know, this feels like a weird thing to say, but I had been living in the States for a bit when I I first came to India. Within a year of coming to India, I made that film. It felt very presumptuous to write so authoritatively about the lives of queer men in Bombay, given I had never lived in the city. Mm. Moreover, I was writing about the lives of people who don't have their lives represented up on screen too often. So there was a certain responsibility to do it right. Mm -hmm. But I also felt the most empowering allyship thing I could do is make a film that represented these characters as humans. Fragile and faulty and broken and selfish. And instead of putting them up on screen as heroes, mm -hmm. you know, someone, characters to be forgiven or looked up to. Because, you know, there is a way, there is a whole other way of doing, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to say the word propaganda. It's more like activism. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm like, I don't know if anyone benefits from that. I feel like the most uh, relatable thing maybe you can get from the film is love is just messy. Yeah. No matter what the bloody orientation. It will screw you up in its own fucking sorry, way. And so, you know, let's be nice to each other. Let's forget about judging each other because of 
the orientation or gender or the race and you know so in that way it's a very human film to me just oh yeah absolutely um <clears throat> the relatability of the emotions i think is what's going to draw in and hold our um what well, would hold any audience uh captive and make it relatable to them um it's um dramatic but are there any or were there any comedic bloopers that you can recall no not really i love my little laughs i love watching it with an audience there are places where they go oh there are places yeah. where they cackle but i feel like <clears throat> it's the kind of film that in my experience you're smiling to the point of laughter but not really haha -ha. it doesn't have like that kind of comedy but i think you're smiling because it's relatable or you know someone who did that or you've done that or you've been there so i think it's got a little bit of it's got a bit of that but no no not really i mean i made the whole film in 16 days okay that was going to be my next question yeah i don't have the luxury of bloopers i mean <laughs> like the way this thing was made we were shooting at a frantic pace on a daily basis dealing with the weather and elements and the in 100% of the entire film is shot on location moving and dealing with elements and natural this that and mumbai is a very expensive city um and i'll actually speak to something you had said earlier you know where you felt like the film could take place anywhere which was very important to me like back in 2015 and i'll say to some extent even now would you make a film like this and you pray and hope the festivals will take notice because that's what brings you credibility to then get to sales but even back then when we started sending it out some of the most prestigious film festivals around the world would come back to me and say you know this film could take place anywhere why should we program it it doesn't give us a peep into india and i would always find that so weird i'm like you know i'm having this conversation with you with a glass of champagne at a four seasons hotel and you got picked up in a big international airport in a mercedes this is the land of contrasts mm -hmm. there's all kinds of lives here why does india have to be restricted to your version of poverty porn mm -hmm. <clears throat> why must all those films get programmed you know because it, you know i understand the benefits of giving your audience a peek into a life which is completely different from theirs but there's as much benefit in your audience getting a peek into lives which make them go we're all human all over the world yeah you know a film set in jamaica doesn't only have to be about the things you expect from jamaica a film set in canada does not have to have you know snowmobiles and a a like it's ridiculous and i especially felt i needed to make a film that was about the cities and the you know like the hotels and like you know the contrast of a bmw cutting through a village which can't afford like electricity or mm -hmm. you know like just you know paint all these different kind of places in a 36 hour weekend where you understand this is india and that is india too and that is india too and that's good because uh around any type of cultural uh identification it is so often um the larger media <clears throat> that pigeonholes and creates the stereotype instead of saying there is a swath of existences uh, and it's not a parallel universe it is all together and we're all one and so that was just a, a stunning uh, conversation to have and to show us on screen well as we wrap up this time together is there anything else you'd like to mention or share with our our viewers um i'm again i'm so grateful i'm so excited that the festival picked the film i think festivals are so important um they are the reason why all filmmaking has not descended into advertising yeah i think this is one of the few places where we can celebrate art um i'm so glad that love was looked at looked up again i and yeah anyone that has questions after seeing the movie i'm on social media it's at the rate i a m suds i am suds you can look me up by my name by the title of the film whatever dm tweet whatever i'm happy to answer questions or 
I'm so grateful you, the audience that chooses to watch this film, um, picked us. I know there's so many options out there. And thank you so much for helping us celebrate queer life in India. Oh, before I go, where are they now? Where are the, the two lead actors today? Like the <clears throat> actor or the characters? The actors. So Shiv Pandit, who played Jay, the traveling businessman who lands up in Mumbai, um, he's busy in Bombay working in a whole bunch of films. I, he just had a show come out on Amazon Prime called Bombay Mirijan, uh, which is about the criminal underworld. Um, Siddharth Menon, the short, cute boyfriend who stays back while the two of them go on a trip. Um, Alex, um, he's also very busy um, doing a whole bunch of art house cinema, Marathi cinema, which is regional cinema in Bombay. Um, so you'll find, you can catch his films here and there, you know, at traveling circuits. Um, undoubtedly, the saddest part of this is Sahil, um, played by Dhruv Ganesh, the young musician boy. Um, he never made it to the world premiere of our film. He saw a rough cut in edit and he contracted tuberculosis and we lost him. Um, it was devastating and it took me a while to get over, if that's possible. Can't make a film but without falling in love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, yeah. Actually, like, I, as I was telling you, this is my first night in my new home. I haven't even set it up. But the first thing that's gone up on the wall is that painting. And it was made by Dhruv's mother. And she sent it to me three years ago. Um, and it's like, it's a weird, uh, anyway. Um, Love was and remains his only film as a lead actor. And I think he had a huge career ahead of him. Um, I was looking forward to making more films with him, but such is life. Thank you for sharing that and my sincere condolences to you, his mother, and uh, the community that loved him and mourn his passing. Uh, what are you working on now? Um, and you already told us where we could find you on social media, but what's in the works now? Um, I just finished another feature film, um, which is in final stages of post-production. And it's uh, actually... Uh, We've been, I traveled a whole year with it on festivals. It did its US press, Santa Barbara. Um, well, it's been playing here and there, winning prizes. And it's a very different film. It's about a young, ambitious woman working in um, in Bombay. And she's on the eve of a massive promotion at work when she you know, gets a personal, big personal news and she has to decide what she's going to do. And sort of a uh, very young woman in India, female driven story. And I'm also in the about to deliver a show. I made a series for Amazon Prime as a writer, director, and showrunner called Masoom. Um, it's subject to retitle, and it's uh, set in a boarding school. But the young lives of young women, like uh, a gang of six, seventeen-year-old women, all in a boarding school, and the friendships and betrayals and fights and interpersonal relationships. And I am also editing another spy thriller for this big Indian studio which is about a Indian diplomat in London and her falling into a web of lies and espionage. And that one's a theatrical film and hopefully all three should be out sometime next year. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for uh, bringing, I'm excited to see uh, those, whether we review them at a festival or not, but those are wonderful uh, projects. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thank you for enhancing our patron experience virtually. Um, these are moments I wish we could have in person, but Believe I me, want everyone. Yeah. DC in I've got such good friends there. I love the city. Yeah. Thank you. So to our patrons, make sure you screen love. It's a feature film. And if you don't have your tickets yet, get your tickets at the dccenter.org uh, hashtag, I mean, backslash real affirmations and expect all of the feels, laughter, tears, reflection, and awe. So on behalf of Kimberly Bush, the director of the DC Center and Real Affirmations, we invite you to join us for this iconic film experience. 
signing off now with immense gratitude to our filmmakers, to supported patrons, August's roster of sponsors, who include Mario Bowser's Office on LGBTQ Affairs, Gilead AIDS Health Foundation, Wegmans, and Tito's. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you at the movies. <laughs>